so that you are under the grip of an ideology when you perceive things around you as obvious. And in some way, you know, I needed to supplement this theory with a more psychoanalytically inclined uh, texts, especially you know, from Freud, post-Freudian and Lacanian domain to understand really how is, this, how is the subject, the person, truly emotionally interpolated? What role desire, drives, fantasy play in this upholding in a way of power? And most, many times this upholding happens also through various forms of silences. So, I liked uh, uh, already, you know, uh, when I, I was very young, an essay by Václav Havel, who said that, you know, uh, he, he wrote a sh short story of a greengrocer, saying that, you know, you ha that you have a greengrocer on the streets of Prague who doesn't believe in the communist power. But every 1st of May, he nonetheless puts the communist flag in his, the window of his shop, thinking, I don't believe in the power, but it doesn't cost me anything to put the flag in. I have still my personal you know, disbelief in the regime. And Howard's conclusion was that the regime actually doesn't need his inner belief. The regime needs the flag you know, and his silence, in a way, so the fact that he keeps his belief for himself. So in some way, all these kind of things uh, that I studied in the past, how does the power work? How, that, how the people who don't believe in it actually support it brought me to start questioning in the neoliberal society, society which promotes individualism, you know, the market, um, uh, and so on, uh, the idea of choice. So I used my old apparatuses to look at this sort of, a, let's say, capitalist invention of what I call an ideology of choice. Why I call it an ideology of choice? Choice is, of course, a, a very important uh, uh, thing in our lives. Now, if we look historically, the idea of freedom of choice was often debated in the context of demands for democratization of the political space. But in the developed post-industrial world, choice became more and more, and I think from the 70s on, primarily linked to consumerism. And there was a reinterpretation of subjectivity that happened at that time. So, you know, like I looked at some particular examples of how this reinterpretation uh, happened uh, in, in my book. I speak, I look at, for example, at a certain kind of a shift in language which started happening in, in the 70s, for example, in the United States, um, when there was a big battle over uh, abortion rights. Suddenly, a shift happened in the language that abortion was more and more perceived as a choice. But when this shift happened from right, you know, that something is a right, to that something is a choice, there is a different interpretation of who is the subject behind it. So the subject of rights is an abstract subjectivity. So those of you who are lawyers or political theorists probably know a lot about sort of the history of human rights and you know the philosophy on which contemporary understanding of human rights is sort of kind of developed from the kind of a Kantian reinterpretation of the Descartian cogito, where, you know, to say briefly, Kant sort of like uh, theorized his subjectivity as in some way empty, in the meaning that the subjectivity is sort of not determined, neither by biology nor by society, by culture, which means that this reinterpretation of subjectivity as in some way kind of an empty, undetermined, opened up later on the space for the subject in some way to detach him or herself from the very society in which he or he lives. Now, if we perceive a subject <coughs> as determined, you know, by culture, by biology, and so on, 
we don't have that kind of a easy possibility to in some way detach ourselves from this determining surrounding and critique this very space. So this abstract subjectivity presented a certain kind of, a, let's say, even a, a, an opening for the thinking of democracy uh, in political theory. So for example, French uh, 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 philosopher, political theorist, Claude Lefort, wrote you know, about sort of like a kind of a subject at the core of the idea of democracy, but also the idea of human rights as the one you know, who is sort of like looking from some space above to the very space that kind of uh, 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 formed him or her, and in, in, in a way, a critical way. And as before also said, because of a certain emptiness at the core of the subjectivity, who is a bearer of human rights, we are also having a constant battle for their expansion. You know, if first men were bearers of human rights through the battle, women, you know, became two. Only in the 80s, we have like, uh, you know, children, you know, as sort of like uh, with the uh, international law uh, perceived as sort of uh, bearers of human rights. And, you know, this expansion has, has been in, in an important element throughout the battle of human rights. Now, with the shifts in the perception of subjectivity, which we can observe from the 70s on, we have more and more a kind of a perception that the subject is primarily a consumer. So not the abstract bearer of universal human rights, but the subject who can make choices. So when I mentioned the example of the American you know, battles over uh, abortion, you know, when abortion became more and more an issue of choice, parallelly also was the discussion of, in a way, who should pay for someone making these choices. And then, you know, the political battles were, you know, of course, around should the Medicaid pay, and, you know, of course not. If a person is doing this choice, she is supposed to pay. And who can afford, in a way, uh, uh, to kind of execute a choice became more and more a question of sort of like a kind of an economy. Do, do you have means to make these choices? Choices not only a simple abstract universal right or freedom, which in a way the state has to somehow help uh, that it is uh, uh, respected. Now, the, the shift into the consumer, the, shift, the reinterpretation of the subject into the consumer, I think has you know, kind of implications to all kinds of the, the dimensions in our life. The subject more and more perceives him or herself free to in a way choose the direction of his or her life, regardless of actually having the means to do so. So for me, well, it's quite interesting to observe American discussions, for example, uh, over healthcare, you know, where very poor people quite often oppose universal healthcare out of the idea of choice. People should have the cho choice to choose their insurer, but you know, people who have no means to be insured still support the choice. So that's kind of, for me, an interesting element of this ideology of choice, that the poor person perceives it's my choice. So my reasoning went there into the emotions that what kind of emotions are triggered when people believe in the idea of choice? So when we perceive <coughs> that everything in our is in our hands, and here I think body, health, you know, love, uh, uh, children, uh, how our children will turn out, of course, death and dying, uh, uh, success, happiness is a choice. You know, we see everywhere this message is happy, yes, is a choice, <coughs> become who you want to be. This is kind of the typical slogans advertising has been using now for like, I would say almost uh, two decades, or, you know, life, book now, and so on. Uh, endless, you know, the idea that there are endless possibilities if only you make the right choice, and that you know, it is up to you in which direction you will go. So, what are the emotions? A lot of the time, we observe anxiety, the feeling of guilt, and the feeling of inadequacy. Inadequacy. I'm not good enough. I have not done the right choices. 
So like last year I visited Chile for a month and did some research there because they are sort of like the, the principal uh, country which adopted in the 70s uh, the neoliberal ideology. And I spoke with psychoanalysts and political theorists about how people are dealing with choice there. And the surprising answer was that they absolutely believe it, in it. Majority of people who are you know poor uh, people, the country is, 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 is quite divided between the rich and poor, believe, still believe that things are in their hands. You know, so a poor seller on the streets, he thinks he's making the choices in his life and he still may, might make it. He still might make it or maybe his children will make it, you know. So that idea, I, 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 my life is sort of the direction of my life, the success is something I'm in a way utterly responsible for. For. And in this country, I was quite surprised that this idea is so strong when people actually have an official working week of 46 hours, and you know, majority of people have also a second job. So almost no time to kind of improve your skills to kind of, let's say, maybe make it or get a better career if you're stuck in some low-paying uh, job. So my idea has been more and more that these feelings of anxiety, guilt, and uh, in a, in a, uh, inadequacy are a necessary uh, element of the ideology of choice. Because when people are perceiving choice primarily as an individual matter and less and less as a social, communal matter, and when they perceive themselves as so responsible for often, you know, impossible. Uh, choices or choices that they can't even make, uh, even as consumers, then you know this anxiety and the feeling of guilt is pacifying people. People are looking more and more inwards, and you know what is better for the power structure than people who are blaming themselves for being poor. You know, so my <laughs> my idea has been that this ideology has helped the neoliberal regime to go on for so long, even in midst of economic crisis and all kinds of you know, problems, catastrophes we have experienced in the last years, and especially in the midst of growing inequality or you know, sort of like a big divide between rich and poor. Now, people seem to be anxious, if I look a little bit closer at anxiety, for two reasons. Uh, quite often, you know, people would have in, in I would say, a post-industrial or you know, neoliberal time, the feeling that no one is in charge. Now, there has been a shift in the perception of authorities, uh, where you know, kind of, let's say, traditional authorities, especially in the, in the developed world. But you will tell me, I hope, in the in the uh, in the discussion, what is happening here. But in many places, the traditional authorities have been for some time losing their power. And if I perceive him traditional authorities, the father figures, the religious leaders, you know, we have uh, numerous uh, uh, cases of, of uh, 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 sort of uh, crimes committed by, by the Catholic uh, priests all around the world, for example. So that in many countries, there has been a loss of identification uh, with with these old authorities, or you know, majority of our politicians are now comedians, you know, in our country too. <laughs> but what is kind of uh, tragic is that we don't laugh at them, you know, or you know, they don't even. They're not funny. Huh? They're not funny. You know, so, the, so the kind of the comedians who are actually not funny, especially when they come to power, you know. Uh, so basically, but there is also not that much of. Uh, uh, identification with them or respect. Also, the community leaders either don't exist or again we perceive them often as corrupt, not uh, respecting them. So, th there is a shift in how the identification in a broader social setting has sort of operated in the last decades. It is useful here to uh, kind of uh, uh, use for analysis uh, uh, Lacanian term, the big other. Now, a French psycho psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan introduced this term, the big other, not to think about the big brother, but more 
to sort of uh, reflect the broader social setting in which we are born into. And that could be language, uh, institutions, unwritten and written rules, culture, sort of in some way, the very space that surrounds us at, and it is in some way here before we come into the world. But the reaction that the person has you know, to this space, and especially language, is really important throughout the process of socialization. So in psychoanalytic circles in the last decades, there has been a lot of talk whether something has changed in the big other today, whether the big other in a way still functions in the way it did in the more traditional uh, times. So one of the interesting definitions of big other by Lacan is that the big other doesn't exist, but it nonetheless functions. What does it mean? The social symbolic structure, the space around us, is never whole. It is you know, always marked by antagonisms, by the divides, class divides, gender divides, you know, all kinds of other divides. There is a battle over its interpretation. There is also, you know, the cultural space, even our country, you know, is highly unstable, you know, especially in your land, you know, what is the land of Palestine is constantly contested from the occupiers. But even in my case, my former country, Yugoslavia, was a certain kind of a big other which collapsed. Now, when the big other collapses, you know, there is a very unsettled moment for the subject. There is a certain kind of a, a lack, you know, which gets exposed about this, you know, big other. There is, in some way, you see it visible, the void in it. And, you know, I remember when the communist regimes collapsed, uh, how many former communist countries started cutting out from their flags <coughs> the communist star. So in the first weeks, you know, after the collapse of uh, communism, most of the countries had the flags with the hole, you know, <laughs> going around, you know, celebrating uh, the end of communism. But, you know, very quickly, you could observe the search for something to put into that hole, you know, for some old, uh, some kind of an old uh, 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 symbol, you know, uh, invented or, or, or something, you know. Uh, there was a battle for how to recreate a big other. Uh, history was rewritten. You know, we started writing the history that we have for hundreds of years uh, desired our own country. I don't remember in our youth that there was a big desire for Slovenia to be an independent. There were some ideas, but very marginal. But at the same time, when we became an independent culture, it was as if this is a long fulfilled dream. OK, now you know our political theorists are you know, rightly saying we fulfilled our dream, but we sold our country. You know, because pretty much once we went through transition, we sold all the enterprises, especially the publicly owned, you know, uh, enterprises to foreign corporations. You know, sometimes under the pressure from foreign uh, banks and other, you know, institutions. But sometimes out of our own desire to kind of catch up. And in some way, in this moment, we also didn't make any choice. You know, so once we got, you know, through, you know, the separation from Yugoslavia, there was no moment of a reflection of what we as a community are choosing as a regime. We wanted to destroy something that you know existed in the past, and we sort of kind of flocked you know, to the West, hoping to catch up with a neoliberal ideology which has kind of permeated uh, the Europe and you know, the rest of the world by then. So uh, it is interesting also to observe now other countries who are going through this transition uh, I visited last sum, this summer Kosovo, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in a, now an independent state, and you know, majority of people there don't want to live there. You know, they want to work in Switzerland. So, uh, uh, an interesting artist, Driton Salmani, who lives in Pristina, is reflecting wonderfully through his artwork this, you know, desire to have a country, but then not wanting to live there. Uh, so he created like a writing on a bus. <laughs> 
uh, which said Zurich Pristina Zurich, you know, Zurich Pristina going back, you know. Because as soon as there, you know, people who live abroad come to visit, they say, ah, it's great that we have an independent country, but let's go back to Zurich. Mm -hmm. Which is why his latest artwork is lovely. Uh, 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 he is using old photos of for the where the Kosovars were struggling for freedom, the posters, you know, free Kosovo, but instead of the writing free Kosovo, Driton is putting in Zurich to Zurich. You know, so they demonstrated kind of hoping to be outside of the country they were fighting for. Now, this change in Big Other, therefore, in an important way affects the subject. So what has been theorized by, you know, uh, some, uh, especially French writers, has been how did this change happen? And uh, one uh, writer, an interesting uh, uh, theorist, uh, 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 Charles Melman, a French psychoanalyst, for example, perceives the change in the subject's perception in the big other that, in a way, more and more the subject perceives that as if the world is kind of rationally organized. And you know, in some way, this assumption is behind the idea of a rational choice. The domain of subject, in a way, the domain of the big other seems to be kind of overflown with information which is supposed to help people making choices. But they, this kind of a, you know, proliferation of information usually does not allow us you know, to kind of choose in a way better. And of course, we need to take into account that nowadays, majority of our choices, you know, is not only linked to you know our the usual uh, influences like our unconscious, the fantasies we have, or what other people are using, uh, uh, or what other people are choosing, or, or what others like a family wants us to choose, but also more and more by the intricate surveillance mechanisms and you know me manipulation mechanisms that are happening with the help of the collection of big data, you know, collection which is done continuously uh, with the help of big corporations, the state, and, you know, the opaque world of algorithms that is sort of kind of, in a way, uh, uh, not only sort of ma making influences on our choices, but also more and more on political uh, uh, decisions, too. So another theorist, the French theorist, Robert, uh, Danny Robert Dufour, has also created his own theory of the changes in the big other. And his idea is that every culture, in a way, in its own way, tries to kind of discern the footprints, foot, footprints of its origin, which is why we paint the other, we sing this other, we try to give a form, a voice, a stage, in a way, and kind of present something that is, in a way, irrepresentable. Now, his next point is that instead of the kind of usual big subjects like big authorities, we more and more have a small authorities with whom we identify. So in the online world, we have all kinds of uh, you know, new, new uh, gurus or uh, you know, people we identify, although we maybe never meet them. Uh, various self-help writers are becoming the new authorities. We even have so-called mini celebrities, you know, people who create kind of communities online, you know, and, and, and so on. So the subject is more and more decentered. The symbolic space around him or her is anomic and diffuse, and which is why, you know, the discussions in uh, the theory of postmodernity has focused that there are no grand narratives anymore. There are no strong authorities. And the individual seems to be pushed in a way to the limit where he or she actually perceives him or herself as a self-creator. And you know, as a self-creator, and that's like the next important element in the ideology of choice. And here in the 70s, Jacques Lacan made an interesting observation in one of his lectures in Milano, where he start, where he discussed what he called the discourse of capitalism. So he said what his idea was that capitalism, in a way, starts functioning as a regime which sort of interpolates the slave, the worker, the proletarian, into a master. 
Now, the person is still slave, but he or she thinks that he is a master, a master in a way capable of making choices about his or her life. Now, Lacan's idea was, in, in some way, this system of capitalism goes quicker and quicker. And we have seen that, you know, in some way he was right, you know, like the speeding up of everything, the production and consumption. And he added up that at some point, this subject who is under the illusion that he or she is a master, that he or she can choose the direction of his life freely, in some way starts consuming him or herself. Which is why in psychoanalysis, it's not surprising to, to observe such an increase of the symptoms where the subject is literally, in a way, eating him or herself. You know, from anorexia, bulimia, self-cutting, addictions, uh, uh, sort of like, uh, 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 like uh, overworking, or, or all kinds of these problems that, you know, majority of people are talking about. And, it's really interesting to talk with analysts to hear what they are seeing as the change in society uh, in terms of the symptoms. How many now say that people don't come anymore into analysis because they want to complain about parents and so on, but because they are kind of feeling that they are not, in a way, good enough, that they have not worked enough, and you know, a lot of the time also because of the cruelty of the workplace. As are the new, you know, it is as if the workplace is somehow replacing the troubles that people have had before in the in the kind of uh, biological family. So this anxiety that we are experiencing is is, uh, is appearing, you know, to be related to the social changes and to the interpolation which the ideology of choice is creating for the subject. Um, I did a little, uh, uh, not long ago, a little uh, kind of um, uh, research uh, on the internet on which anxieties exist because there seems to be like a proliferation of anxiety in today's world, like an endless list of uh, <coughs> anxieties. And you know, I came to most banal uh, anxieties. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, um, list one of anxieties sort of was dealing with particular female anxieties, and to my surprise, I saw that very highly on the list is a dress anxiety. I didn't think that there is like a disorder, like a dress anxiety, although I suffer sometimes from the decision <laughs> what to wear to a particular event, but there is a whole enterprise, especially American psychotherapists who are you know, specializing in the ordinary dress anxiety, but also in the wedding dress anxiety. Oh, now, different. the wedding dress anxiety, of course, is enormous the problem. However, when you le le uh, read a little bit about those anxiety, you see that behind is quite often maybe anxiety over the question of the choice of your husband, not so much the dress that you will be wearing, you know, but the dress might be easier to deal with. You know, it, it's an anxiety which maybe covers another anxiety <coughs> behind you, which is more difficult to put into the words. Now, there was also a survey done by an American uh, uh, online uh, 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 kind of a TV uh, 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 site, uh, US Live TV, where you know people were asked to list the five most important anxiety in their life, and I would thought since Americans have been so bombarded with terrorists, viruses, natural, natural catastrophes, and economic crisis, that they would list them, you know. But no, no one said terrorists or economy. People were anxious first because they felt that there isn't enough. Now enough of money, enough of love, enough of recognition, something enough. Then they said, the second, that they are afraid that they won't like him and them anymore. They were, they were afraid of rejection. And that is interesting because from the 70s on, actually we have a, an invention of a new syndrome which is called the imposter syndrome. Now, the imposter syndrome was first theorized in the early 70s. The idea, the idea was that some women who succeed and you know, get like a post, uh, an important post uh, at work or in any other domain in their life, 
start feeling that they will be discovered that they are fake, that someone will see through them. You know, they are not not up to the point where they came. You know, the, to the to the point of success. And later, this syndrome presumably kind of uh, shifted to men too. So that now we have men with the imposter syndrome that I'm not good enough. Now, you have to know that imposter usually was used for the term when we pretend to be someone else. That we are like, we take a symbolic name of someone, we pretend that we have a diploma we don't have. And it's interesting, a kind of a mirror reversal of this imposter syndrome that we have a symbolic recognition, but we, are, we don't feel that we are sort of like deserving it or up to it. Now the third uh, anxiety that people listed was that it is too good to last. The certain uh, feeling of uh, impending loss. The fourth one, it will be, you know, it's sort of uh, uh, again, you know, sort of linked to the to the fact of how people will, other people will perceive the subject. And the fifth was uh, that the person felt that his or her life doesn't matter that there will be no legacy created by the subject. Now, interestingly, you know, in this survey, uh, of course, you know, Americans immediately consulted uh, some therapists to give advice how to overcome this anxiety. And the therapist gave very, you know, usual advice. You have to convince yourself when you are suffering from anxiety that you deserve happiness so that you have to put a sticker on the mirror in your bathroom which says, I deserve happiness. And as soon as you are anxious, you go look at that sticker. And the other advice is that you have to create a list of positive enforcement. So whenever something good happens to you, you have to write down, or when you get a compliment also, and the idea that if you look at this, you know, when you're in crisis, that will help you. Look, I doubt you know, that this uh, helps anyone, but it is interesting how quick uh, you know, the whole industry emerges around these anxieties. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, for the dress anxieties, you can see for yourself, if you have dress anxiety, there is an enterprise called Calm Clinic website, which can teach you how to dress for success. Because their idea is, that you know the way you dress can open your doors in regard to whether you will succeed or not. So you have to also in some way uh, avoid dressing truly only for someone else, but also for yourself, so that you are kind of happy with yourself, the usual things. Now in midst of these feelings of guilt and anxiety related to choices, the issue of social inequality is often pushed aside. And the fact that people's choices are highly determined by their economic status is often ignored. Now the success of the ideology of late capitalism in some way is that he, it has created the fantasy of a possibility in midst of obvious impossibilities. And even poor people who have fewer and fewer choices you know, identify with this fantasy. And I think that this is the success which is still ongoing. I, after economic crisis in 2008, at least in the developed world, not much has changed. Not much has changed, and we are sort of pretty much back to usual. I like a, a survey done in the, uh, 2011 by Dan Ariely and Michael Norton from MIT, who analyzed how the Americans perceive inequality. And they asked people whom they questioned, how much of the percentage of all the wealth in their country is in the hands of the top 20%? And what should be actually the, the just distribution of wealth? So people responded in some way that majority of people thought the top 20% have 60% of everything in their hands, but they should not have more than 30%. So, so they thought a little bit more, but not more than 20%. Now the reality at that time was that the, the rich 20% had 80% of all wealth in their hands. And you know, in this last eight years, it probably increased. I don't have the last uh, uh, numbers. So why do people actually 
you know, if they perceive some the inequality as something that is against their reasoning <coughs> of what should be a just distribution, why don't they rebel more? Why don't they support enthusiastically larger taxes on the rich and maybe universal health care in the United States? When these results of Ariel and Norton were presented to a number of uh, uh, theorists, uh, uh, from economists to political scientists, uh, New York Times created its own little kind of a survey, which I found interesting when they asked specialists to interpret these results. Why people you know, who think that the, the distribution should be different are not uh, rebelling more against it? The answers were quite illuminating. Now, the first answer was that their country, the US, is still driven by a certain kind of a lottery mentality, which means that people think that they might still make it in the future. And here, I would add that the idea of chance and choice, in a way, start going together, hands in hand. That when we are making choices, we also sort of hope to have a kind of a chance, you know, that there will be just like a kind of a lucky chance for opening our doors you know, to the success. Now, a lot of the people who don't think that they will make it might nonetheless think that their children will make it, which means that you know, when I have an impression that maybe we'll, my child will create a startup, and I hate this word startup, you know, why for so many times in the past we were just calling it business, and now when you're creating a business, you have to call it a startup because of this magical thinking of this incredible success, like uh, we are already heading to Silicon Valley when we have a startup. So, you know, people who think that maybe their children will make it, you know, of course don't want to tax the rich. Why would you want to t tax your future rich child, you know? <laughs> now, the, the next interpretation was that people more strongly identify with those who are similar to them, like their colleagues, and their neighbors, and the very rich, the top rich, live so outside their imagination that people are not even envious sort of towards them. And I would add to this that there is, you know, this kind of a media interpretation also that you know a person became like super rich because of a perfect invention. And that, that kind of idea that he or she was so smart and there was such invention also in some way kind of legitimizes, you know, the idea that, that one can get like so rich. And there, you know, in my small country, we are only two million, million people. And we are also obsessed with startups, you know, like everywhere you have startups, startups. And I don't know what they are starting, but definitely they are doing something. Uh, but our most successful business, which sold for one billion dollars, is an invention of a game for an iPhone or for like a mobile phone, which is called a talking tone. It's a cat which talks. Now, the business which invented it, the family, sold it to Chinese who are with the help of this app easily controlling the users all around the world. Now, the family, of course, found all kinds of ways to kind of hide that one uh, billion dollars in Cyprus or, or elsewhere, but they are like heroes of the media. You know, a lot of young people hope they will find a talking dog who will speak with a talking cat or something, you know, similar. If it were at least an invention of, I don't know, water irrigation system or, or how to grow more vegetables or something, I could imagine, you know, media being so into them. Now, the next explanation was that many people have feelings of guilt, that they have overspent, <coughs> and they are actually guilty for their financial troubles. So this feeling of guilt in, in some way also pacifies you that you are rebelling again, less against the feeling, the, the inequality. And the next explanation was that many middle class people actually are under the impression that they are actually not doing so badly since they are in possession of many gadgets and that their lives might be better than you know the lives of their parents which in some way often is not true at the time of crisis there is also not so much a desire to have than the desire to keep now 
as I said before, before, in some way, this idea of choice, which sort of underpins, I would say, these beliefs that everyone can make it, is also sort of linked to, to, to the idea of chance. However, quite often, you know, chance can be in its own way anxiety provoking, you know, which is why, you know, when we are dealing with, with, with chances, you know, there can be a kind of a horror that, you know, sort of like, you know, we cannot decide because it appears, you know, too, too impossible for the person to kind of uh, uh, make a choice or, you know, take a kind of a leap. Uh, of faith and you know resort to uh, a chance. And let me give you an example of how I experienced this anxiety in my own home. Once my son, who was then you know uh, quite young, had uh, two tickets for a very important concert, and two uh, uh, one ticket for himself and the extra ticket for one friend. But there were two friends who wanted the ticket, and there was like an agony over this choice. The question of who is the oldest friend, the first friend, the best friend, who deserves this and not, you know, we were kind of going on and on over this one ticket. And, you know, my father said, but in sport, you allow chance to decide. You know, you have to sort of flip a coin and, or, you know, throw a dice and let the dice decide. The boys decided that's a good way to deal with the tyranny of choice. It's very banal choice. But they said, we are too afraid to throw the dice. You know, it has to be my father, you know, who throws the dice. And because in some way, they didn't want the responsibility even for this chance. <coughs> you know, he threw the dice, the dice decided, and boys continued to be friends because someone else sort of uh, uh, decided the chance kind of took control of it. Now, there can be, in a way, a comparison here with the idea of the market, you know, that the belief in the market, in a way, often is kind of grounded on certain randomness. Uh, there is a kind of, a, you know, always a possibility of possibilities where we have, you know, <coughs> applied to the, to the market. Now, interestingly, in the history of philosophy, it was Cyril Kierkegaard, Danish philosopher, who defined anxiety as related to possibility of possibility. So, you know, his idea was that actually what is anxiety provoking can be the very element of freedom. The very element where everything is in some way poss possible. And, you know, uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre complicated that reasoning by saying that you know what is anxiety provoking often in our own lives is the very possibility to end with. So he said that when a person is standing in front of the abyss, uh, he or she is not anxious necessarily that he or she will fall, but anxious that you know he or she can throw himself or herself into the abyss. That there is a choice related to death and life per se. Uh, you know, uh, Camus even more complicated this uh, saying when he said, you know, that every day he is dealing with a terrible choice to have another cup of coffee or to kill himself. <laughs> now, let me, in conclusion, uh, point out the next problem with choice. Choice we perceive nowadays more and more as something rational. Uh, books that promote positive thinking, for example, encourage people to choose the direction of their lives, not to pay attention that most of our choices in our lives are influenced, as I said, by others, society, by their conscious, and so on. But an element which is important for choice is that often choices are given and denied at the same time. And here I will use the term for <coughs> choice. Uh, an example happened already in my youth, you know, when uh, boys in Yugoslavia had to go to serve in the Yugoslav army. But this serving in the Yugoslav army was an element of forced choice. Because when you became conscript, you went to a kind of a ritual of signing the oath, which said, I freely choose to become the soldier of the Yugoslav army. Now, a friend of mine 
chose not to sign. If it's a choice, then I'm not signing. You know, you can imagine he ended up in prison. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have observed similar versions of forced choice uh, in many other, you know, situations, you know, like uh, when it was discovered um, uh, that Americans are torturing uh, prisoners in Iraq, you know, many prisoners, after, especially Abu, after Abu Ghraib, uh, you know, had to sign, prisoners who were released from prison had to sign a document which asked them whether they have been tortured. But the interpreters advised the, the prisoners, of course, to say that they have not been. Because if they sign that they have been tortured, they would not be released to, from prison. So again, another example of forced choice. Now, even in daily conversations, we often are offered possibility of choice when we actually don't have a choice. Let's say we have elements of politeness. You know, I offer you my water, and it's kind of understood you, you might refuse it, you know. Like, uh, uh, but, you know, I still offer you in some way as a choice, but, you know, it's sort of like a choice which is not really meant to be a choice. Uh, Lacan also uses the term forced choice when he speaks about, um, uh, let's say, an imaginary crime, he says that, let's say, we have a robber who comes to us and says, your money or your life. And this is a forced choice. You know, if you choose money and give life, you can't enjoy that money. You know, so you can only choose to give the robber the money. Now, joy, forced choice is an important act of the social bond. There are, you know, all kinds of political examples where forced choice exists. Now, let's say, even when we have kind of mocked trials, choice is offered but also rejected at the same time. But, you know, also in kind of all kinds of totalitarian regimes, we have acts of forced choice, for example, in the forms of elections, which are completely uh, sort of, uh, let's say, staged, uh, 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 manipulated, you know. Even the totalitarian regimes, in some way, need to resort resort to force choice or to keep the fantasy of the individual's free submission to the regime preserved through this idea or this kind of a charade of elections. Now we can say that today ideology insists that we have choices in all kinds of domains of life as private life and elsewhere, where actually the only thing we are dealing with is the cases of forced choice. We might actually have very little freedom to determine what to do with our lives, but the ideology needs our impression that we could have done it otherwise. Now, psychoanalysis in a strange way embraced the idea of forced choice. And Freud coined the term nervosenwahl, the choice of neurosis. Now, he did not think that we sit down and invent our neurosis. But he thought that the subject needs to be perceived in some way as an author, not in a rational way, but nonetheless as an author of his or her suffering. So if I go back to Kant's idea of the empty subjectivity, at the core of Freudian subjectivity, you also have an emptiness, a lack, where the subject is perceived as not determined. So it's neither biology, nor culture, family, or the surrounding around the subject that determines the suffering of the subject. The subject, even the rheumatized subject, creates his or her answers to what happened to him or her. So the symptoms are of his or her own creation. Again, not in a rational way, in an unconscious way. But why was for Freud important to keep this idea of forced choice, the forced choice of neurosis? Because only in this way he could think about the possibility of change. If we perceive the subject as determined, change you know, is not possible in the way it, that it is possible when we perceive the subject in some way as not determined, when we imagine a certain element of an emptiness, which in some way, for Freud, was also kind of strangely looked 
to, uh, linked to kind of a, his interpretation of <coughs> audio. A change, a shift can happen. You know, we don't know how. It is not a rational shift, maybe through long years of working on one symptom, maybe long years of analysis if a person can afford it, but a shift can happen. Now, he used this for this an example of his patient, Dora. Dora was a woman who had lived in a very traumatic family. You know, the father had a you know, love liaison with the best uh, friend, and the mother was quite passive, and Dora was constantly complaining in analysis that the family is guilty for his suffering. But Freud's idea was that in a way, actually she had put herself in the position at the core, in a way, of this kind of a crisis in the family where she could constantly blame others but found some kind of a strange enjoyment also in the position of the victim. However, his idea was also that because in some way he was, let's say, an author of her neurosis, a shift, a different perspective, a difference in suffering, you know, maybe a change in the symptom is possible. In this case, it didn't happen. She escaped from Freud's treatment, but you know he <laughs> analyzed his own failure in a way, in a in a helpful way. Now, people psychoanalysis knows also very well that people desire quite often a certain prohibition, and Freud pointed out that when cultural prohibitions cease to exist, people often invent new prohibitions just to keep desire alive. Let me give you an example from the 60s liberation of sexuality in the United States. Surprisingly, in the last decades, we found kind of a turn to some prohibitions, like you know, at some colleges, they, they, they started having celibacy clubs, you know, as if people wanted you know, to self-limit, uh, you know, to keep kind of desire alive. And you know, we in Slovenia, in advertising, uh, used some years ago the slogan, the logo, don't go to Slovenia. The idea was that you prohibit something and then you keep desire alive. And you know, when I looked at the consumerism, how consumerism relies on certain prohibitions, something has to be off limit, unavailable, that we desire. <coughs> Usually when we get it, we don't want it anymore, or we forget it about. That's how, in a way, consumerism very much relies. You know, something is only limited edition, uh, hard to get. You know, others want it, and so on. Which is why I like reading in a in a Japanese uh, newspaper uh, in, in 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 English about a whole new of kind of pop-up stores that they had. Uh, uh, you know, kind of popping up at the outskirts of Tokyo where they were selling hipsters uh, clothes that young people desired. But these shops, you don't, didn't really know where they were. You had to really struggle to figure out where they were located. So people you know, did a lot of research. Then there were no clear times when they were open. You know, so that people would come there and stand in front of the doors you know, in the rain, and there were images of people in the rain waiting for this random opening time. And when they came to the store, they were prohibited to buy things. So the, uh, the shop assistant you know, acted as particular kind of torturers. So a person wanted a t-shirt, a desirable t-shirt, and the shop assistant would say, no, I'm not selling it to you. I'm selling it to this person, but not to you. Can you imagine the enjoyment there was, you know, guessing whether this new authority, you know, will recognize me that I can have that object, you know, and the desire to get it when you are rejected. So we can say it's a self-imposed limit which we choose, you know, when we go to this kind of enterprises. Now people are also inventing self-prohibition online. I was quite uh, impressed with the self-prohibitions I found on an online uh, blog in the United States for women who ran huge debts on their credit cards. They decided to create a community, they didn't know each other, where they were reporting each day how much they have spent. And if they have overspent, they felt terribly guilty in front of their computer. You know, it, they never met these people. Maybe they were not even people, maybe they were bots with whom they are talking. But the feeling of guilt was equal as if they were reporting to an authority of the old kinds, you know, like parents or husband or something, you know. 
and you know they they invented this limit we can say they invented this self-binding mechanism the block to kind of deal with that trauma where, with money now self-binding mechanisms of course existed before you know uh, Odysseus tied himself to the mast not to be, not to succumb to the songs of the sirens. That's a self-binding mechanism. We also self-prohibit. Let's say, if I want to stop smoking, uh, I would tell my friends, uh, you know, that I stopped smoking so that I will feel guilty if I lit a cigarette in front of them. You know, that's kind of another very banal daily self-binding mechanism. Now, in the very conclusion, let me say that in some way I want to keep the idea of choice alive. Although I have presented the critique of what I call the ideology of choice, nonetheless, the fact that a person is able to make choices opens up the possibility of change. The problem today is that choice is very much perceived, the rational choice, and that its understanding is linked to the kind of this eco economic theory, especially still from the sort of neoliberal or the liberal times of the 70s, and you know that the choice is primarily glorified as consumer choice. And of course, that the subject is kind of refashioned from the bearer of human rights into the consumer in all kinds of direction of his or her life. As I said, you know, this thinking of choice as linked to a kind of forced choice, uh, the psychoanalytic reasoning of choice, in a way, might be of help. The fact that psychoanalysis takes a person as responsible in some way for his or her symptom, uh, this is another important thing, that the symptoms are not perceived as something that simply happened to you, but in some way there is a core of responsibility about it. Again, not in a rational way, but the responsibility in a way that you might gain something from your symptom, from your su suffering, which might be pain, but that can be also an enjoyment in pain which is why psychoanalysis goes against utilitarian reasoning that people are trying to maximize their well-being and minimize their pain. You know, quite often the opposite is true, that people will find some kind of a painful enjoyment, you know, the term jouissance, the French term jouissance captures better this pleasure in displeasure, which is why people don't give up easily on their suffering. Uh, no, the idea of kind of change, however, has to be protected. But in, in some way, you know, we, we have to say that in contrast to the rational theory about choice, psychoanalysis sh cho shows, uh, shows that choice is, involves elements of the unconscious. And of course, that it involves desire of others, that we are in a way constantly questioning what do others want? And what does the big other want when we are making our choices? We are guessing what does the social symbolic structure around us perceive as the right choice, it's not simply perceiving choice as you know completely individual matter regardless of this social setting. Now, it, it is critically to reflect on the late capitalist ideology which insists on self-making and self-fulfillment since I think that this ideology, together with the glorification of happiness, increases anxiety, makes people more submissive, more self-focused, focused and less critical of society around them. Margaret Thatcher became famous for saying there, are no, there is no society. There are only individuals and their families. Now, this perception is sadly still permeating the pores of today's society. The feeling of guilt for being poor has replaced the fight for social justice. And the anxiety that one is not good enough has pacified people. So that nowadays, not only they work long hours with their jobs, they equally work on themselves. The choice is also opening, in some way, the possibility of change on the level of society. However, this can only happen if it ceases to be perceived as solely an individual matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm looking forward to hear
how choices are dealt with in Palestine. So and you can choose to ask questions. You can choose, but no, you, know, you have no choice. You have to not ask the question, but also tell me what is actually happening in a way here, which I'm really curious to learn. Becky, you want to say yeah. So speaking of um, individual consumer that you've talked about and the choice decision making in accordance to issues relating to considerations that uh, affects that affect on uh, consumer judgment and choice. Now I've attended three uh, lectures that you've conducted and you've uh, said something about advertising and it really grabbed my attention. Um, it's okay. Uh, you said advertising. Oh, sorry. He said advertising uh, is somehow, uh, or it somehow reminds us of our important choice. Now, I couldn't help but wonder if whether these choices, um, consideration sets, really exist, and if so, um, how does that affect the composition and structure that uh, consumer have on their decision making? Should we take some more questions? Please. I have a comment. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe it's not on the question, but it's Maybe a question also. Um, you, you mentioned Chile, so I, just, I was just curious about this because I know that uh, when the IND regime fell, um, when the British regime, regime came to power, um, I mean, they put mechanisms in place that actually made the choice, or actually, you know, promised the illusion of success. Uh, that, you know, you can, I mean, currently in Chile, you can actually take out loans, you can buy cars, you can buy houses very easily. So I think, in a sense, actually, that already, like these mechanisms in place already restrict your choice. So, in a sense, to understand, because your comment on the poor, it made me think also, uh, with this, with regards to Chile and also with regards to healthcare in the US. Yeah. I wonder if it's. Um, that they, okay, that they believe that they can make it, as you said, in Chile, yeah. or actually that the mechanisms in place provide that opportunity. So in a sense, they, you have no other choice, actually. Because you can easily take out a loan in Chile. I, I was there, I also I, I visited a lot of people, and I was there for six months. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. You can easily take out a loan, you can easily, and I mean, my friends also, they were not, you know, they were not coming from very, like, rich, you know, medium, or, uh, let's say, upper, oh, well, sorry, lower class, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was very easy to take out loans, you know, to have that kind of success. So in a sense, the, the logic of, you know, I can make it is already established because the, the mechanisms <coughs> in place, that I, that Pelletje put in place and afterwards, already allowed them to do that in a sense. So I wonder if it's actually, you know, a choice, in, because there's no, other, there's no other option to have. You can take out a loan and go to the university, you know, and yeah. that's done. You can take out a loan and buy your car. So I wonder how... How do they feel about these loans? Anxious? No, I uh, guess maybe, but actually, but there's also like more countries right now in that sense. I wonder if, if that concept of choice actually exists. That's, that's my question also. You know, if, it, if there really is a choice, or as you have started at the beginning with the example of Slovenia, that there's no choice actually. I mean, this is a system that, that's currently there. It's already there. And, and you can't really, I mean, if you want to, you can't really, you can't really choose to become better, and then you will need the car. No, and, and yeah, I just think that you, there's no choice. I mean, you know, you can take out a loan and succeed. I mean, but there's no other option, really. You, I mean, that's my. That, that's a question that or maybe a comment. And um, and also uh, the last thing you mentioned about uh, choice, perhaps allowing change or or you know, let's say that um, different reality. Uh, and this is also related to Palestine. So I I wonder what space the, um, in your like analysis. Um, does the idea of collective choice also take place? Uh, I mean, if, if, you know, if you're in a collective uh, uh, struggle, a collective movement, so? Oh. If you're in a collective struggle? No. If you're in a collective struggle, a collective uh, movement, so in a sense also uh, that notion of collective choice really exists. And maybe that actually destroys the notion of individual choice. So it just, it's a, also a comment. Or, um, yeah, so thank you. Anna? I'm 
I'm, I'm not sure if this is, you know, really a good time. I just want to raise one issue. I'm, I've been trying to, you know, um, to um, a little better to frame what you are saying in terms and conceptualizations that are closer to me. So. Um, the connection between choice and right is, is, I think, extremely important. But I wonder whether, whether, whether what you presented is an, 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 an inverse of, of the way I would like to perceive it, which is choice is a, <coughs> is a way for someone to stop fulfilling their obligations. So a choice is a relieving yourself from a duty. So I relieve myself from a duty. So instead of, for example, suppose I have a duty to do a lecture, and I'm not prepared, so I come to class, and what do professors usually do when they are not prepared? They give you the choice to present whatever you want. <coughs> Group work. Group work, yeah. Or, yeah let's get presentation. Yeah. Uh, participatory, I don't know what. Huh? So, so what do we do? The government, for example, is obligated to protect my health or to protect me, but then I get to choose which kind of insurance to get, and then the responsibility becomes mine. Or uh, uh, the way I, uh, the, I mean, the, the place where I myself am getting this idea, I was writing with a colleague about something. So there's a, in international law, there's an obligation to protect that in Palestine has been shifted simply to a question of providing aid to the Palestinians. So you pay some money, but then aid, aid is a choice of the, of the foreign country. It's not an obligation at all. Yeah? So if, uh, whatever, say, um, uh, uh, Germany has an obligation to, uh, to protect Palestinians because they are devastated, they don't have you, it's a war situation, etc. Instead of fulfilling this duty, they choose to uh, they choose to not fulfill this duty, but rather resort to some sort of charity, where I get to choose, or I am supposed to be able to choose whether I want to receive or not receive this charity. But then later on, if you look at what Trump has done with the, with with Palestine, it stops even being a choice. So first, first you. First, you, the technique goes like that. First, you um, give up your duties. You replace them by a choice. Then the choice becomes a charity. Uh, the charity creates an obligation on the, on the, on the charity, <coughs> on, the, on the other side. The obligation uh, means that you have to be, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, you have gratitude for those who provide you with this choice. Then, because th then you have a, a particular way of expressing your gratitude. You cannot express your gratitude. You have to be politically correct in expressing your gratitude. So you have, for example, to subscribe to the values of the of the charitable. So you have to love rule of law. You know, respect rights. Yeah, uh, also. Uh, yeah and be anti-terrorist and what have you. Hate violence. Everything, right? So I mean, but but there is a list uh, of you know how do you show gratitude? N not the way you like it, but you get, you get this list. And then if suddenly if you do not show this gratitude, then you, you know then, then then you don't get aid. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what eventually said. So the question is really: Is it really choice, or is it the the choice of the big other not to fulfill their duties? Presented as a choice for you, or mispresented. I I will translate. تحديد إذا كان بالفعل هو إحنا عن إن خيار ولا لا والسؤال مش بس يعني فقط في جوهر في بحث في جوهر الاختيار ذاته بل كمان في الإنسان كيف هو بيفهم هذا الخيار 
So, okay. So, so um, my question goes along the lines of uh, when you when you when you when you talk about people's choice. Uh, one is, is there really a choice, and two is that choice if it's there. Is, it, is, is that choice coming from within, or, or it's a choice that is imposed from without? ومثلا علم الاعصاب حاول برضه يجيب على هذا السؤال وتقريبا اثنين اتفقوا على انه نعم ممكن لكن من خلال مداخلتك لاحظت انه لا انسان لا يمتلك خيار and the notion of determination that can be chemical, genetic, what have you, within the within the uh, within our sort of nervous system. Um, uh, on on the one hand, she understood that you were uh, presenting the idea that there is actually no choice, but then you eventually ended up saying that you have to choose. <laughs> And how does choice impact the individual identity? Okay. So maybe we'll talk yeah, and maybe yeah. there will be room for one yeah, more. Yeah. Some more. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, the advertising, uh, I think that advertising plays a kind of an interesting role. That not necessarily that you know it kind of completely convinces us that when you have this advertising, life is your choice, choose now, and so on. Which it's kind of everywhere, you know, for now uh, more than a decade. Uh, uh, I think that it's not that people identify with it, but I think that this science, the advertising science, become like the element, just one other element in, the, in this ideology around us. So it's not that people identify with it or believe in it, they have all these choices and so on to make their life whatever. But you know, in some way they are keeping quiet about their disbelief, which I said like at first, you know, how ideology functions. In some way here is similar as we were keeping we were quiet in regard to our disbelief. We are quiet in regard to the disbelief in some way that quite often we might have in our personal life about all this advertising and uh, self-help manuals and uh, women journals which are talking to us, you know, uh, make the best life, the best body, the best love life, and so on, you know, out of it. But the underside of this being quiet is the increase of the emotions I was talking about, the, the, the self-critique. Uh, women, you know, and men are increasingly suffering. And like, you know, what uh, you have been working on, the online media, you know, I found very interesting research on the women's self-perception in regard to their bodies. If they observe people online, and that they are their friends, or they are celebrities, or whatever, the, the feeling of inadequacy can, can be quite equal, you know, you know, when they see that they are not as beautiful or well dressed as their friends or the celebrities, you know, this feeling I'm not good enough is on increase, but even more was on increase on the women, uh, in the women who were posting, those who were just lurking and you know they were quite dissatisfied, but those who have exposed themselves and posted their own pictures, their anxiety increased that they are not good enough. So the participation, is, I think, is shaping, in online world, is shaping subjectivity in a new way. I'm not kind of, I don't want to be a catastrophic, you know. I, I, I see there are values, you know, even in computer games. I'm not like a kind of a purist. But there are also elements where subjectivity has been changed. And it's changing, and I hope in the, my next project, 
I will look more in uh, depth into how this ideology today in the developed and developing world has sort of altered the subjectivity and what kind of, let's say, suffering we can observe today. Um, about Chile, yeah. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the Pinochet regime really with, with his Chicago boys, you know, bringing back the economists who have been uh, trained uh, in the Chicago's uh, uh, school have uh, started, uh, you know, a very important process of both privatization uh, of the state-owned enterprises and individualization. So what my Chilean's friends were pointing out is that society which has heaps and still to a point relies on, on the networks of families, you know, friends, is becoming more, more and more atomized. You know, the families still exist as a core in, in some way, but nonetheless the community, the, the, the links between people they feel, you know, are less present and that, you know, the idea everyone for him or herself or for one's family is highly propagated. The, the idea of success, happiness, which on the higher echelons of society also is shown interestingly through the symptoms they are experiencing. So I spoke with psychoanalysts who work with very wealthy people, the people who made it, mm. whom, you know, one of the psychoanalysts introduced an interesting term, like a kind of a split day denial. Um, he observes with his patients who are like bankers, lawyers, you know, in the rich part of, of Santiago, that they are living like a kind of a, during the day, the work day, like a, like a, a perfect life. It means early morning into a gym, eating organic food, working, earning money, and so on. When the evening comes, it is as if they, are, they become another people, another person. You know, they start drinking, taking drugs, you know, as if they have kind of secured their well-being during the day, and then they can kind of ruin it all during the night, you know, and that the struggle <laughs> that they have, the justifying this kind of a split is, is quite interesting. The idea that people can make it, yes, is linked to what you uh, wonderfully described, the system of loans, which is another huge problem, as I understand also here, you know, where consumerism truly needs an indebted subject, and we can say also the kind of the political regimes more and more need an indebted uh, person. Uh, the person who, you know, kind of uh, buys loans for all kinds of consumer project, uh, objects, not only for, let's say, education, but, you know, when you take the loan, when, when you have such a regime that education is not free, you know, when you need to take the loan, you are indebted for decades to come and pacified in its own way, you know, for yes, you have made the choice, you know, search for a better education, but like as Americans know, it's a nightmare for a majority of people paying back those loans because, you know, the law also perceives this uh, loan as the most important. You can bankrupt with other loans, you know, but like not with the loan for the education, which is kind of a, another important punishment, long-term punishment for people. Um, we then we move to yeah your uh, uh, idea yeah I I could subscribe to the addition to my theory that you uh, uttered um, but I would add a couple of twists when you say choice is a relief from duty I think choice can also be perceived actually as a duty in the meaning you know of uh, uh, of a sort of like the the person being uh, interpolated as the one who has to constantly make choices about his or her life. So it's a kind of an anxiety provoking uh, duty. I think that uh, when you perceive this whole idea of the aid and so on, here too, we can go back to the shift from the subject to the consumer. You are in a way uh, not anymore, as you rightly pointed out, kind of the person uh, or the state uh, dealing with the issues of international human rights, you're dealing with the issues of international aid, you know, which means also we kind of are more and more dropping the term rights, the, the human rights, you know, from the public discourse, 
uh, and uh, you know when you look also at the developed world, aid is uh, has replaced the right there too. Right is not only the freedom from, you know, it's also freedom to. So which is why the uh, you have to have a certain uh, a, a kind of a, 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 a social uh, element in them. You know that it's not only the pri the freedom to uh, to make elections to 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 be free from oppression and so on, but also social rights to have health care, you know, education, uh, safe environment, and so on, which we are in a way abandoning even in our fights for against um, uh, global warming. For example, we are not speaking about the right to the uh, to the clean air or, or 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 the right to the earth, which can sustain us. When we were talking about aid, I started thinking that you know, in the West, you have now philanthropic capitalism. You know, so that like that you have these rich people who are giving money for research or, or, or whatever, which of course has completely changed the logic of the state. Instead of the state taxing uh, people, you know, now it is the individual deciding where the money, their, their money should be uh, used, and of course are paying, you know, even less taxes because of their philosophic, uh, philanthropic pursuits. Your um, discussion- Which is even worse because their choice, how, what, what to support, Exactly. It's called social responsibility. Absolutely, and, and it is their choice. We should not forget that it is their choice. If their the choice, choice is suddenly, it's, it's another thing. Yeah, now when you were speaking about aid um, and uh, uh, sort of this gratitude <laughs> one has to have towards receiving it, aid, the aid, I was reminded of the Bosnian war. And uh, there is with aid always a fantasy on the one who is giving aid in regard to what does the other need, you know, what does the other need to whom we are we are adding, we are aid, giving aid, you know, even when we give to a beggar, uh, you know, some small money, quite often we give some kind of a moral, moral advice to, to, to him, but don't buy uh, drugs or wine with it, you know, if you are adding, giving aid, you should relinquish control of what choices the other will make with your money that you are giving, but we often, in a more grand scale, with the aid, have this idea of what kind of aid you should give to Palestine or other places. But also in the individual way, when we are giving aid, we have a fantasy of this kind of an ideal victim. And I remember at the time of the uh, Bosnian War, Slaven Kadrakulic, Croatian writer, wrote a wonderful op-ed for New York Times when she was collecting her stuff at home, uh, what the stuff that she planned to donate to the refugees, Bosnian refugees, and she started giving only, you know, sturdy shoes and warm jumpers and so on, nothing sexy or beautiful or feminine, you know, and then she started reflecting, I'm creating an image of a refugee and an image also of what does the, re the refugee wants. Well, a lot of refugees in this desperate situation really wanted something elegant, you know, maybe a pot perfume or, you know, something just to keep feeling a little bit kind of normal in, in the horrible circumstances they were, they were in. So the, the fantasy of what does the other want, and of course what you said, you know, rightly the politically uh, a kind of correct response that this victim uh, should give and of course you know as soon as the victim ceases to be the victim as soon as, as soon as the victim fights for its rights you know usually you know we don't have anymore you know so the freedom fighters the fighters who want to change their position usually are denied aid which is you know another form of control um, the last, uh, the choice, uh, yes, is inspired by the culture, by the social setting, by the family. Um, I was asked an interesting question at the, my first lecture at Qatar uh, uh, Foundation, Qatar uh, Foundation, by a woman who said, you know, how can I fight against my parents who are imposing choices to me, you know? And um, I think I, um, uh, as answered a bit uh, uh, too short. I, I, I kind of gave a little uh, advice how you know one can sometimes 
make the other perceive that the, the others invented what the choice that you actually want to that he gives you as an option. You know that sometimes you know the wife might already decide something, but allows the husband to have the illusion that it was his choice. And sometimes as children, we know how to play the parents in, in this ways. But I think that now. You, I would un answer differently that uh, these parents in position, it's in some way quite often also not their own choice, you know, because they are embedded in a particular setting, you know, a social community or, you know, have a set of belief or fears, and they are, they are transmitting this fear in, through the imposition uh, of, or prohibitions or the imposition of choices that they are. Uh, demanding uh, their children uh, to choose. Uh, so <coughs> the social setting, yes, it exists. You rightly pointed out that things are getting even more complicated with genetics. So in my book, which I just finished, uh, it's called The Passion for uh, Ignorance. It comes out next year by Princeton University Press and hopefully in some other languages. I have a whole chapter on that, exactly. In regard to genetics, quite often now we have the impression that the subject is becoming, in a way, predetermined. Now we know that even in criminology we have reasoning, is crime uh, inherited, uh, or you know, in regard to illnesses, the idea is often that we don't have many choices, but there are also a lot of anxiety whether we want to know or not, or whether we should inform someone about the potential genetic predisposition. But interestingly, in a psychoanalytic kind of a little field that looked at this, and there has not been much analysis, you could see how individually people deal with their, the information about their genetics. How they create a completely individual fantasies about what is a gene in them or brain in them. And also, you know, how many times people actually prefer not to be burdened by the information which, you know, the way that we know about genes now is often inconclusive. There are only, you know, kind of a limited number of illnesses which have a clear uh, genetic cause. Many illnesses might have an element of the genetic, but then uh, there are other elements, the society, the environment, food, uh, the stresses that we live in that might cause those genes to get triggered or not. So which is why we actually did not yet shift so much in our understanding of the subject. The subject still in some way creates his or her answers even to the genetic uh, sort of question of genetic predisposition or even to certain, you know, impairments, physical impairments, which is why I like to study neuroscience. Uh, my research group in Ljubljana, we did a book on uh, brains on trial to see how law, especially criminal law, you know, is now using uh, 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 neuroscience. And we are now um, finishing another project on genetics and law. And we have seen, you know, how socially constructed it is, you know, the perception of what is the brain, you know, how the brain, you know, uh, didn't really, that knowledge about the brain didn't really limit the ideas of free will, which are still the core in the legal uh, discourse, even if free will is a kind of a, like a necessary illusion for the legal system to function. Okay. <laughs> Our, uh, our uh, translator is uh, uh, tired. Shukran, <laughs> Duman. We can move without translation. Okay. Anybody has something? Yeah. No, no, please. Please, the bell. Becky is standing. Becky, what's the plan? The plan is we'll we go the, see some museums and then and then get back to Kofi. Becky made the choice. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time of the election. I I need an external authority. Becky is her dice. Huh? She is my dice. <laughs> my, my guardian angel. <laughs>